Hello, folks. Welcome back to the piano lesson. I'm Jonathan Eder. Uh, and uh, today I uh, just wanted to touch on a few things. A uh, bit of a stream of consciousness, but uh, I don't know if any of you folks uh, watch 60 Minutes anymore. It's kind of an old folks show. Um, but uh, they had a interview uh, piece about Rick Rubin. And Rick Rubin is a prominent music producer who's been around for many years who started the Def Jam record label and uh, was responsible for producing a lot of uh, early rap records and is kind of a guru that people go to to uh, get the records produced. And it made me think about uh, the whole process of how music gets produced, but more importantly, how society works in general. And if you think about all the parts in a band, all the jobs to make a record, the bass player, the drummer, the keyboard player, the engineers, the promoters, and you know, the producers, um, the most important person in the mix, the most important person in uh, uh, achieving success, if you want to call it success, is not any of those people. It's, it's the most important player in the band is the guy who plays the Pied Piper. Remember the Pied Piper? The uh, infamous mythological story about the uh, uh, flute player that tries to, uh, or, or is uh, uh, hired by the town to lure the rats out of the city, uh, and uh, that tale goes back to the 1400s and maybe before that. And uh, instead, he lures away the children and he steals, uh, either steals the children or the children are killed. Or, and it's not just a myth, it's actually, they actually think historically there's some uh, historical uh, 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 evidence to support that there really was some guy, some Pied Piper type character, who uh, rounded up all the, the kids uh, uh, in, in the neighborhood and march them off to their deaths. And why do people follow these people? Uh, and, and, why did, and by the way, why did he do that? I think it was really because the, eventually the town didn't want to pay him. Uh, so that's why he did it. But you know, it, it really says a lot about um, society because Rick Rubin, by his own admission, has no musical knowledge or skill or talent. He doesn't play an instrument. He uh, doesn't, um, you know, hasn't studied music. So, so, why, so why would anyone follow him? Why would people who are consummate artists and uh, great musicians, why would they even care what he thinks? Well, somehow they think he's imbued with some kind of special, magical uh, uh, genius. And I guess he must be in some way, um, to some extent, because evidently he's been, you know, financially successful. Um, but there's something about human beings that want to follow people and don't really believe in themselves and need someone else to tell them that they're good enough or smart enough, or as Al Franken used to say, doggone it, you know, people like them, right? But there's, some, there's something about human beings that need a cult leader. And if you watch this 60 minute segments, it's very interesting because you know, he really does look like the quintessential cult guru with the long beard and the sandals and sitting in the lotus position. And he's, um, has this very sort of angelic, sweet way about him. Um, and uh, it just makes me um, wonder, like, 
what happened? What happened to society? And I think during the interview he mentioned that uh, he liked rap. He was drawn to rap because it wasn't music from the ivory towered conservatories. He wouldn't have used those exact words, but that was something to that effect, you know. Um, as if there would be something wrong with trying to uh, to promote people who have devoted their lives to making music and studying music. I mean, it just seems a little odd, but um, there, you get, it kind of makes you, to me, it kind of makes me wonder, like, you know, what happened to music? What, what happened uh, back when, in the 80s, and when rap started, and um, what, what was going on in society? It, it just, it just makes me think that if you suppress education, uh, this is what happens. Uh, and you have a whole movement of people that are um, doing something. They're, they're creating their own reality. Whether you like it or you don't like it. Um, it's a suppressed group of people, suppressed economically, suppressed educationally. Uh, suppressed socially, and they've decided to take political power in their own hands, and they're going to uh, make their way. Um, and that's there's a, the group of people that will do that. And there are always people that are opportunists and will exploit that uh, for better or worse. You know, I I, I kind of group pe group people. There's two types of people. There's people who put people in groups and people who don't. No, <laughs> but there are. I think of there as being three three groups of people. There's opportunists. There's idealists, and then there's ideologues. So, the idealists are those that truly believe in something good and are willing to sacrifice their life for it. I mean, and, and who are believing in something for the right reasons. Now you can believe in the right thing for the wrong reasons also, right? And, and it's important to believe in the right thing for the right reasons. But the, then, then, then you have the ideologues that seem like idealists, but they're really not. They're very rigid-minded. And uh, sometimes we use the word conservative. Uh, I think that's a euphemism for someone who's closed-minded and regressive, uh, but someone who will come hell or high water, they uh, will make sure that uh, they fight for some kind of uh, ideal that has been put into their heads, and they are see they they are. Um, impervious to reason. They have a, what I call a, a pride of ignorance, which, uh, as Charlie Chan once said, uh, the uh, uh, pride of, uh, of ignorance is undefeatable. And uh, <laughs> then you have the ideologues, excuse me, then you have the um, opportunists, the last one. And the opportunists are those that really don't believe in anything. And those are the ones that seize opportunities where actually idealists and ideologues fail to uh, um, benefit. So they, really, they don't really believe in anything. They just kind of blow with the wind. And if they see an opportunity, they grab it. And I kind of, you know, think we're maybe all a bit or all we all have aspects of these characteristics in us right it just depends on what you lean towards you know more so um i think of rick rubin though as probably more of an opportunist 
And uh, I had a friend of mine many years ago who uh, was responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars in investments. And um, he would tell me that the people who make money are opportunists. They're not entrepreneurs. He would say entrepreneurs lose money. Those are, those are more idealists. And the opportunists are the ones that make money. And I kind of have to agree with them. I don't, they don't really believe in much of anything. And um, Now, uh, that's really a lot of what I think has happened to not just the music business, but probably business in general. I mean, when I remember how I remember the music business, <laughs> um, I mean, I remember growing up in a period where you had independent radio stations and you actually had living, breathing disc jockeys that, you know, again, you may or may not like, but, uh, and some of them may have, in, in fact, been corrupt or taken kickbacks, but in fact, they did have personal tastes. Now, I mean, now of course, you do have lots of that on the internet, but um, the, these were people who did wield power until all the radio stations were uh, bought up by large corporations and the DJs were replaced by computer playlists and uh, most of the real music went somewhere else. In fact, you know, the, I mean, I don't think anybody listens to radio anymore for music per se, right? I mean, it's what they listen to uh, now is just, uh, you know, it's called talk radio, you know, and most of it is hate-filled radio. Um, and that's that's targeted towards a certain group, but it just made me it just made me me think uh, that you know what what is it about people that where they need to be told that they're good enough, and what is it about people that they need to be told what is good and what isn't good, because that's kind of where I put the category you know how I how I categorize a guy like like Rick Rubin and there's a lot of people like that. But, um, you know, when after Bach died, uh, no one played his music for about 200 years. And in fact, there's, a, I think this is, well, there's a story, uh, of course, people might be acquainted with Glenn Gould, named Glenn Gould, who became synonymous with Bach, right? And, and uh, what is considered to be a, a great interpreter of, of Bach. And again, whether you like him or you don't, um, that was what he was known for. And he, he once again popularized Bach. Um, and early on in his performance career, uh, he went to Russia and he started to perform. And Russians were not real big on playing Bach and certainly not the Preludes and Fugues. And uh, until they heard him and they realized, oh, yeah, <laughs> we, we get it. <laughs> we, we, we see where we're missing out. But... Um, so so much of humanity um, is led by the nose. And of course now we're told that AI uh, is going to tell us what to do or going to lead us. Um, and uh, one of the criticisms I hear of AI, and I'm going off a bit on a tangent right now, but one of the criticisms that I hear about AI, uh, about artificial, about machine learning and artificial intelligence, is that um, regardless of whatever answer it might spit out, it's impossible to tell how the machine arrived at whatever answer it arrived at. It's pretty much a black box, and uh, that's the criticism. But when I think about the human mind, uh, there's no more of a black box than, than the human mind. And we uh, follow the pronouncements of people all the time without giving much thought as to how they arrived at what they arrived at, right? Um, let alone um, scrutinizing their methodology or their process. So uh, that part of accepting AI, I think, is, well, that's 
let's call that a no-brainer. How's that? It's a no-brainer. Uh, that's not a problem for human beings. They can accept things without understanding how they were arrived at something. If that, was, if that wasn't the case, we wouldn't have religion, right? <laughs> we wouldn't have all kinds of things, or astrology, or who knows. Um, but um, what, I think, what I think is happening now is that we've, and I say we as a society, we've forgotten uh, what music is to a large extent. Um, I, I don't think uh, many people could really define what music is. They certainly couldn't define what a song is um, or what a melody is so, or, or, or just the basic components of a piece of music. Um, I'm actually much more interested right now in the sounds of nature because nature talks to itself and communicates to itself and it's there is a music that goes on um, whether it's the sound of the birds or the sound of uh, frogs or uh, fish that make noise but um, whale sounds um, there is an inherent language there is an inherent uh, it, it, that's embedded in 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 nature and in, 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 around us um, I, I might be rambling a little bit right now and maybe I am but I'm I'm trying to figure out why it's so difficult for our society to do what's right and to do what's beautiful it's very difficult for some for some reason and uh, maybe you have some thoughts as to why that is or why why that isn't but in, in my estimation it seems like it's it's uh, quite getting getting harder and harder and I've used this analogy in the past about pianos it's a, a the piano lesson the piano show but to me the main reason to play a musical instrument, the main reason to play a musical instrument or to sing and certainly to play the piano is to inculcate beauty in one's life, to experience beauty. And it's a very abstract concept, but it's uh, a rewarding and enriching concept. It's really the reason, in my estimation, to be alive. Uh, just playing one note on the piano, one note, on the keyboard is enough um, and for all those people that are learning on keyboards learning electric keyboards or playing keyboards that's fine it's a convenience I have keyboards myself but you're, you're not playing the piano uh, and I, I don't want to go into a long explanation about that other than there's so much complexity and nuance and beauty in a acoustic instrument um, and if you've never experienced it well uh, maybe it's time you did because uh, it's well worth it and um, when I think of this the sound of acoustic pianos now if you go out and buy a, a new piano and you walk into a store and you, you play a note on the piano they're designed to make that note very easily playable. Um, you know, if you try to play a note on a what I when a, on a Steinway on a, on a nine foot Steinway concert grand, let's say, um, it's difficult. And if you try to play a song, it's quite difficult too. I mean, they're they're incredible instruments that take a lifetime to really learn to control. It's kind of like shoes. How shoes are made. Shoes are made to feel comfortable in the store. They're not really made to be comfortable to walk in. You know, they're made to be sold. So you get in the shoe you, in the store, it feels squishy, cushy, right? And you go out and then your feet hurt. Why? Because real shoes actually are firmer than that. And they're made differently. And they have what are called lasts in them, you know, sometimes steel lasts that would hold your uh, uh, arch. And um, all of those things are a bit misleading, but the, the acoustic instruments 
to me, sound electronic. They sound very bright. They sound uh, very, uh, very uh, cla like, like a, uh, overly percussive, and they're difficult to control, and they don't really have a lot of gradations in tone as the traditional kind of Steinway instruments with, with soft hammers. Um, and uh, part of the reason, I think, is because, A, people have forgotten what a piano should sound like and how it should be played, but also because the electronic instruments are driving the conception, the sound of the acoustic instruments. And there are generations of people who are now dead, who formally made instruments and made pianos. And uh, a piano, you know, unlike, let's say, a violin or a guitar, which can be made by one person, really, uh, a piano can't be made by one person. It's sort of a factory process, and it's very expensive and time-consuming. Most of the pianos now are made in Asia in huge factories. Um, the the uh, cost of labor is, is quite prohibitive, as everyone knows. But um, it, in my estimation, the sound of acoustic pianos are approaching that of an electronic instrument. And yes, it is true that electronics have gotten better and they are mimicking acoustic instruments better and better uh, in certain ways. But uh, I don't think they'll ever be there. Uh, and again, for those of you that are playing keyboards and you know, you're worried about, sh should my keyboard have a weighted action or not? You know, well, it really doesn't matter in that, you know, if you have a weighted action, um, you're not really learning still. You're not really learning how to play the piano. It's not a matter of developing muscles, right? I mean, it's the, the piano actions have weight because they, the, the key is part of a larger mechanism that incorporates many different moving parts which ultimately facilitate a hammer striking a string and there's a lot of nuance involved in being able to depress that key and produce a tone, produce a beautiful tone. There's the word beautiful again. So you could have the best weighted key action on the face of the earth and I think I do actually. I think the um, my uh, Yamaha uh, CP, it was a CP1, I believe, was, was to me the, the best action that's ever been made. But you're still not playing the piano. But the, the, uh, the sound of the electronic instruments are getting better, in a sense, if you want to say that, and the acoustic instruments are getting more like uh, electronic instruments, and they're sort of meeting in the middle. And let's just call that our cyborg, <laughs> our human machine uh, result. And um, that's what we're ending up with. So the idea that someday in the future uh, AI is going to conquer us, uh, that day happened a long time ago. Uh, it I happened with calculators, actually. <laughs> okay, um, probably. It started, that's where it started with the television. That's probably when it started. You know, But um, it... Uh, it, it, it uh, uh, human beings have forgotten what reality is, and it's very easy to do that if you if if you keep them in a bubble, and the bubble being computers, internet, uh, you never go to a concert, you um, never really understand the history of music. Um, it's kind of like, I, ca I call it the, the tomato theory. You know, if you only buy your tomatoes in a supermarket and never grow them yourself, you'll never know what a tomato uh, tastes like. And of course, you can only really get good tomatoes at, at a certain time of the year in August, you know, where it's, it's a seasonal thing, right? Um, but because of our society, well, we want tomatoes all year round, all the time, you know, because we have to have them, and it's really important, and if we don't die, you know, we'll die. So we have to have these, you know, right? And so we, we 
decided that a long time ago that we really don't need real tomatoes. We need as long as it looks like a tomato, tastes kind of like the tomato. It's enough. It's red, whatever. That's good enough. And it's the same with music. It's exact, exactly the same with music. And I think that if you are a good musician, or if you um, are a real artist, and you're trying to reach an audience, and you're trying to promote music, um, your music. Uh, and, and, and you find that it goes into a black hole somewhere, and then you, it can be very demoralizing. And then I can see how people might want to seek out a guru. You know, they might want to say, well, guru, uh, what do I need to do to make, be successful, make my music heard? And the guru sits down with you and pats you on the head and, of course, tells you the answer's inside you and, you know, the usual gobbledygook that you hear from the cult leader, right? So I, uh, I think that we're going to, you know, we're going to see a lot, a lot more people like that. I mean, and uh, they're not, they're not going to be going away anytime soon. And uh, I think that it's always probably going to be an uphill battle. It was, it's kind of like um, what, what happened, uh, what happened um, during the Middle Ages when we we had the Black Plague, you know, and um, all uh, uh, knowledge was sort of uh, uh, pushed pushed away, right, until we had the Renaissance. But it it, it is it is a bit um, ironic that given how we have so many opportunities to educate ourselves. And there has been such incredible innovations in communication and transportation um, that, unfortunately, it appears that human beings are be becoming more insular, more limited. And maybe I'm just being negative, but I, this is just what I'm observing. Um, I tell you, my my uh, uh, that's just my my experience. So you can share your experience with me too. Am I being a grump, a grumpy old curmudgeon? Um, I don't know. I don't think I'm being a grumpy old curmudgeon necessarily. I mean, of course, you know, it's a big world out there. There's a lot of stuff happening, and there's a lot of stuff that's going to be happening. But I think if you're gonna if you're going to do something in life, believe in yourself and do it. Don't listen to anyone. You don't really need a guru. You don't need a Rick Rubin. Um, although I must say, if Rick Rubin called me on the phone tomorrow and wanted to produce my record, I would think about it. Right. But, um, you know, you have to you have to have your own sense of right and wrong inside. Anyway, good to uh, talk to you guys uh, again. Uh, my name is Jonathan Ito. This is The Piano Lesson. Please uh, contact me if you'd like to make a comment or have a question, and I will see you guys next time. Until then, Arrivederci.